welcome to the Chicago Humanities Festival in today's program, Gollum Girl, Reva Laren Conversation with David Mitchell. I'm Daniela Mazio. I'm going to self-describe my appearance. I am a white presenting woman with a bob haircut that is brown on the left side and pink tinged on the right side. I'm wearing a black turtleneck that covers my arms and shoulders. I have round glasses and have earbuds plugged in. I'm sitting in an office with natural light. I'm the audience engagement manager here at CHF. I work in the accessibility services that we provide. Um, so I'm very excited about this program and the work we do uh, to be inclusive to folks with disabilities. You can learn more about upcoming programs by visiting chicagohumanities.org and you can support CHF by donating or becoming a member. I wanna give a special thanks to our captioner, our ASL interpreter and our audio describer for making this program more accessible. All digital programs will include closed captioning, which can be controlled through YouTube. To learn more about our accessible services, you can go to chicagohumanities.org access. This week's programs are presented with the support of Fifth Third Bank. Now, please help me welcome, I'm so excited for this program, David Mitchell and Reba Lair. Thank you, Daniela, for that wonderful introduction. And hello, Reva. Uh, my name is David Mitchell. My pronouns are he, him. I'm a white man in my early 50s with short brown hair, and I'm wearing a not very fashionable uh, dark blue linen jacket. Uh, and I'm sat in my office in Ireland, where it's uh, eight o'clock in the evening. And I am delighted to be talking to Reva Leira, author of the amazing new memoir, Golem Girl. Hello, Reva. Hi, David. I am just thrilled to tiny bits to be here. I am a short disabled woman in her early 60s, so I am your elder. You better respect me. And I'm wearing mm -hmm. uh, for a very dangly earring. And, um, and a, I don't know, anxious expressions. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thank you for <laughs> Just a word about your amazing hair. It's, um, it's, it's a sort of dark ruby red uh, layered over uh, a, an extremely elegant um, white uh, with dark undertones below. Extremely artistic. Oh, I love when people come up to me and say, how did you get that part to go so white? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, <laughs> um, your book, um, there's lots of things I'd like to know. Um, you told me about it when we first met, I think, oof, two, three years ago, uh, when I was spending the summer in Chicago. And uh, it sounded really interesting then um and so i asked you to stay in touch um which you graciously did and then earlier this year your fantastic publicist at random house sent me through a copy i was expecting to find it interesting uh my son's autistic uh and uh when when you have a genetically atypical hand of cards to work with in life, um, this gives you a particularly, um, well, it gives you an atypical view of the world. Uh, so I was looking forward to reading it uh, because my son also uh, obviously uh, has an atypical view of the world. And I've certainly learned a lot um, about the world as I've learned about his disabilities. Um, what I wasn't expecting, if I'm absolutely honest, was just how beautifully written it is. Uh, really, every page in its own right is a work of art, I think. I know that sounds like absurdly high praise, but it kind of, it's true. Um, so I'm actually going to skip uh, through... I'm, I'm going to skip over the first couple of questions that I had that were more art orientated. And if I may, as a novelist myself, I'd like to go straight for the writing uh, question. 
which goes like this. Golem Girl is built of stories and anecdotes told with the polish, craft, and dare I say it, the guile of a practised storyteller. Can you account for this? Uh, not entirely. I have very little background in writing. I took a workshop with the very brilliant novelist um, Goldie Goldblum, who I could not recommend more highly, incredible writer, but it was a limited series of classes, you know, sort of a large group. And she was my first editor. And, but I think that um, I'd been doing public speaking for a long time about my work and my work is heavily invested in story, which I think we'll talk about later. And so how to tell a story that would go along with a visual image that would help bring the image even further to life was something I think I had been doing subconsciously for a long time. But mm. and when I read the early drafts, it makes me so nauseous that um, I need to put my head down and breathe. So it's been a long I, I You should see my, my early drafts, they're rubbish. But uh, but that's the point of early drafts. They're where you work out what the story is. They're where you work out how to write the real thing. Um, and often you think, you start off on an early draft thinking, this is it, you're building the Taj Mahal, you're building this uh, eternal edifice of prose, but actually it's just the scaffolding you're assembling. And you, you need the scaffolding. You can't um, build something great without scaffolding. Um, but it is only scaffolding for the first couple of drafts, at least in my experience. I was wondering if in your background, um, in the milieu in which you grew up, would you describe uh, evocatively and memorably uh, in Golem Girl, um, in, um, in that background was oral storytelling valued? Um, did you grow up in an environment where... Um, narratives even if it was just about what happened at the supermarket that day that had a beginning a middle and end a punchline uh if these were valued and if perhaps you imbibed this without knowing you were imbibing it well absolutely and in multiple ways um i was thinking the other day about um family holidays and certainly i mm. talk a lot about conflicts in my family in the book so it's not that my family was some kind of, you know, succumb perfection. But we would get together for holiday and no one fought. There was like no fighting because everyone was just trying to tell a great story and they were talking over each other and people were laughing just from the get go all the way through both sides of the family. And so I grew up in a way knowing that the most fun you could have the, the way that you felt the most loved, I guess, was to be in the circle of these storytellers. But also I talk about in the book that, that I'm a construction and that part of the way I was constructed was my mother's stories telling me about my early life and what my early life meant and how she um, formed it and how she defined who I was gonna be at a time that it was very, probable that I would be defined badly. So I definitely mm. see myself as formed by these stories that were foundational. Um, and then also, I guess the last thing I say is when you're disabled, if you're able, you have to keep telling the story of your body and your experience in ways that get you believed because medicine is very interested in not believing you. And in especially yeah, yeah. atypical. And so you have really got to think about how to be cogent, clear, engaging, and get them to listen. And the higher the stakes, the better you better have mastered that. So I think it's it's like I'd never ever considered that. Uh, and it rings entirely true in the sphere of autism. Um, people who have trained in a particular way off expense uh, have been on a particular program that views a particular 
disability, the one I know about being autism, uh, they have a vested interest in believing the dominant narrative uh, about that disability. And change only happens, improvements only happens, progress only gets made because of changes to the dominant narrative. Back in the 1980s, 1970s, the dominant narrative was autism was caused by the refrigerator mother by mothers consciously or unconsciously, mothers, not fathers, consciously or unconsciously, uh, not loving the kids enough. And that's why autism happened. Insulting, preposterous nonsense, we now know. But that was a dominant narrative. And we've only left that behind because that dominant narrative was successfully challenged. But um, the first wave of challengers, boy, they would have got it in the neck. Uh, and I notice now, um, I'm tempted to say even now, but there is no even. This is the point. Uh, now, uh, this generation of dominant narrative challenges will still be attacked, will still be accused overtly or covertly of, um, of bending the truth, of wishing something were true because it makes them feel easier. Uh, because it makes them feel more comfortable and not because the dominant narrative is in any way wrong or, or, or in need of um, a corrective push in one direction or another. Um, I'm speaking aloud here, and I'm, uh, but, um, but I'd, n I'd never considered that um, to change a narrative, the most effective way is actually not tearfully delivered right. um, exhortations, but actually a damn good story that's true, uh, but is also um, carefully constructed uh, with craft to do its job. It's so, it's so interesting to me in two ways. One is to think about disability language where it where it was up until just like five minutes ago. All of the words for disability were horrendous and insulting and demeaning and, you know, belittling and fill in the blank. And so when disabled people started to choose language for themselves, there, I mean, there's just such a range of what people believe will get them seen and heard. And so like, I don't use, mm -hmm differently abled. I don't use handicapable. I don't even use person with a disability. I say disabled, but that's based on my mm -hmm. experience and beliefs. So the first thing is any disability that starts to define itself is coming out of um, a, a swamp, you know, really. But also mm -hmm. parents up until five minutes ago um, were the ones defining those stories, talking to the doctors, um, and I don't want to. I don't want to spend our whole time talking about medical stuff. But parents were the ones going to the doctors and saying you're wrong, or this child means more to me than you can know, and you have to do everything you can and not just put them in an institution, which was what happened to so many millions of disabled people. They just no one was fighting for them. They were their parents were told to write them off, and so if they live, they live in an institution, including lots of autistic people. And so the first people fighting were parents. But then what happens is that if the child is able, you know, the parent, the parent may have grief um, when they find out their child's disabled. They may have to let go of everything they expected about parenthood. And I've always thought that one of the ways that parents cope is by becoming autodidacts. And that especially for women, that all of a sudden they find out what they're capable of intellectually. And they're learning about mm. illness, they're learning about an entire medical structure, they're talking genetics, I mean, all these things, I think a lot of them never would have expected of themselves. And I think that that position um, helps them 
uh, not only advocate for their kid, but gives them a sense of strength um, to sort of buoy them over the hard part in the beginning. But then if the kid's able, the kid has to start, has to take over that mastery, has to understand their own body mind and start arguing for themselves. And I think it's very hard for a lot of parents to let go of the being the one who is um, in charge of the story and the advocate. Yeah. The, and so I think a lot of the story of my teenage years, for instance, is about that bridge where I really started to need to be in charge of my own story and my own choices and understand my own body. And my mother had built um, so much of her self-respect around being my advocate and she had a medical background. So it was even more intense. So I think about like this language, like this transfer from the parent language to the language of I, you know, this is what I know about myself. I think it can be very hard yeah. and also really um, something I would see, I'd love to see somebody write about, but just how the story changes from the parent to the child. Well, I could propose one writer who, if she could find the time, could write that book. I think of Eva and she's looking out of the screen at me right now. <laughs> um, knowledge is power and self-knowledge is power. Um, and in, in what you've just described, that is true in three or four ways. Sometimes they work together, sometimes uh, they butt heads. Um, you also made me think from what you said earlier, how a culture is based on stories. Um, and we can see this in creation myths. We can see it in uh, national histories and mythologized national histories. But maybe a human being is also an individual body-shaped culture of himself or herself. And we're also based on the stories that are told about us that we tell ourselves, um, are told to us. And it's interesting to think of us as, as, as well as existing on a biological plane, existing on a narratological plane. And perhaps, well, this brings me on to uh, my first, my original first question, um, which is, which I'll call the speed bump question. I find that every book I write is a process of discovering problems I hadn't anticipated, uh, which have to be solved. Um, Good thing is, however, the solving of those problems becomes the book. It becomes the writing of the book. I'm just wondering if this sounds at all familiar for your writing of Golem Girl, and if so, what speed bumps might you have encountered? Oh, I didn't have any problems. <laughs> <laughs> it was fine. It was just like, just butter. It was butter. No. Um, oh, my God. Well, it took six and a half years at least. And, but also I had written it multiple times. I wrote it, there's a version that's all in present tense. There is a version that's entirely uh, thematic where I was, the original way I thought about the book was story of particular worlds. And so there was this world of my family and there was the world of my hospital. And then there was the world of my school. And then there was the world of entering into disability. And so I had written a version where each of those worlds was distinct to try and really get at how different I was in each place and how hard it was to mm. go through them and to let go and pick up all these identities as I would move through. And my editor said, this is so confusing. You can't do this. I go, oh, okay. <laughs> I, knew I tried. So, you know, that was part of it, but also one of the aims of the book was not to hurt people that I felt didn't deserve hurting. And so mm -hmm. I, for most of the people in the book, I sent them the chapter about them um, and said, is this true? Have I made mistakes? And tell me if there's anything that just 
is too much to be in public? And also, do you need a pseudonym? And so there were a lot of changes that went through. There are a number of pseudonyms in the book. Um, yeah. And sometimes that was hard because there were stories that were really important to me and to who I am that I had to let go of. Um, because, you know, I would have other writers say, but it's your story, tell whatever you want. I thought, don't, don't leave ash in your wake. Don't burn people and then think it's all gonna be okay. That you can tell a story that's still true and still real and let people not be in pain. So, but that was also a long process of, well, if I can't talk yeah. about, what can I talk about? And, because every story in the book has a purpose. There's not much in there that's just like, yeah. oh, that's a story. I mean, I'm really trying to, like the thing about the book is that even though I talk about my body, the book is about embodiment. It's not about the story of my body. Like the story of my body is the through line, but the question of what it means to be embodied is for me what the book is really about. And claiming your body, making peace with your body insofar as you can, not making peace with it. And when you and I um, spoke the last time, you know, you just talked about being an embodied story. I thought, well, your characters often are these kind of nuggets of a self. You know, they are a, a story like, you know, like string theory or something, you know, reality is all kind of twisted around and, and immeasurably condensed. And then they occupy these different bodies as they go through time. And so they both have to be themselves, but as they change, bodies and locations, they also change. And, you know, that's fascinating to me, this, this question of um, what is the same and what is different? Because I think I had mentioned that when I started doing disability portraiture, which is a whole long story, um, I had avoided looking at disability, I disavowed being disabled. Like that was really successful. Um, and when I started to really look at people's bodies and want to look at them, everyone was totally unique. Like they were brand new stories. And then after doing a few dozen portraits, I started to see that there were themes and I would meet people and talk and there were themes and there were congruences. So then the question becomes, if I'm gonna do someone's portrait and I know that they have these congruences with other people I've worked with. What is it about this person that turns that congruent story into something that's only theirs? So I wondered mm -hmm. how you feel about that, of like that tension between the similarity between people's experiences and how to pull out what is utterly defining of a single person. Wow. Um, what a beautiful rabbit hole to be falling down. Um, I <laughs> guess my responses are, um, we are um, a dialogue between what happens to us and how we respond what happens to us. Um, what we do with that and this isn't going to lead to anything particularly profound Reva but um as I perceive reality as I perceive human beings in the real world around me so I perceive a fictional universe so I perceive the characters I try to write uh, even this changes over time and evolves as it should if I viewed human beings in the same way aged 51 that I did when I was 13, um, I wouldn't have developed very far. Um, so I suppose that's where I am now. Uh, when I write a character, I think about what they think about various 
determinants, uh, money, sexuality, um, class, education, politics, the afterlife, uh, a slowly growing constellation of 12 or 15 um, things that, variables that um, distinguish us at a surface level as human beings from our neighbours um, or from people living on the other side of the world. Uh, plus, I think about these people and how have they responded to that. Those, of course, are symbiotic things. Uh, if violence is there in your childhood, then how you respond to violence may well be determined by the violence. Um, um, but not always and not necessarily. And how come? So pose where this is leading is just back to stories. Um, we are walking um, or not walking uh, bundles of stories and wow <laughs> just wow <laughs> um, by other people's stories I mean it's not just this um, oh I know something interesting about you it's um, a really profound story always becomes a mirror, doesn't it? Like if something really moves, mm. eventually it calls up questions about who you are and what you believe and what your experience has been. And if your yeah. question is stories, which mine basically is, then, you know, so I'm a portrait artist and the way it works is that Somebody comes to my studio and it can be weeks or months of sittings, like just uh, an investment of, of a year at one point. And so they come and I feed them and we, you know, I always have cookies. <laughs> I bought my own weight and cookies. I remember your cookies. <laughs> <laughs> I can't eat enjoy watching people eat cookies um but you know so each time they come it's a different facet right you know you get a different piece of their life and the whole time I'm staring at them and I'm like looking at every specific I I mean I drew you which hopefully they'll, they had the link for I didn't do a very good job because I was insanely nervous and um and I apologize I beg to differ I beg to differ Eva <laughs> What's David? Not from you. Anyway, um, but so the story gets. And if my wife was here, she'd say, "Just try living with him." If you think he's so awe-inspiring, <laughs> you have to give me her number. <laughs> I'm basically an idiot, and I'm basically a pain in the ass to live with. It. It's just, that's so. <laughs> I'll meet your nervousness and match it and raise it with that. So take that, Leila. <laughs> phenomena where, like, the the stories start to like change uh, what somebody looks like, and so there's this wow. thing I've wow. talked about. Um, called informed beauty. So people ask me why beauty is important to me and what beauty is. And I have a lot of answers to that. But one of the things is, you know how when you just see somebody and you go, oh, they're, they're pretty or they're beautiful and you don't know anything about them. And, and it's just this purely thing about your taste or maybe somebody keeps, society keeps telling mm -hmm. somebody is beautiful. And like I always talk about Taylor Swift, like I can tell she's beautiful. She doesn't do anything for me, but you know, she's officially beautiful. But then, you know, you meet somebody and you don't have a particular reaction, but then you get to know them. And they literally, and I'm not talking in any abstract way, literally become beautiful through the story. Mm, 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 so mm. interesting. And I call that informed. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that's one of the most astonishing things about humans is that our brains can like go in and 
rearrange our eyes. And I, I did a lot of reading about, I had to write a big essay about that a couple of years ago. So I'm calling all these neuro, uh, uh, neuroscience, you know, the, I can't think of the word. Uh, Neurologists. You know, neuroscientists, I'm reading pieces from um, journals and nobody had, there's a lot of stuff about beauty, but I could not find one thing about perception of beauty based on knowledge. And again, grad students out there, <laughs> that's another way to research. But I think that's part of what stories do is that they rearrange what we see. Mm, mm. Um, yes, it's stories. They they trump as an unfortunate verb these days. Uh, stories are regularly more influential um, in how we perceive the world than data, than facts, than hard science. Happily and l l luckily for um, for progress in the abstract sense. Uh, scientists do uh, give more credence to data and facts than narrative. And maybe that's one thing that distinguishes scientists from uh, the rest of the human tribes, because the others, uh -uh, it's, it, it's feelings, it's story, it's how does this move me? It's, does the story relate to mine? It's, can I buy into uh, the stories? And, 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 and as we've seen in many ways in every single newspaper in every country on earth, uh, these narratives shape reality for a majority of human beings. Um, which brings me back to something I was thinking of when you were talking just now. Um, is a portrait, is a portrait an attempt to, to represent a story, uh, a narrative using visual vocabulary, more than um, a photograph in oil or lines or, or, or any other media? Is a portrait a story or an arc of a story? That's my question. It depends somewhat on the artist. Like I think of, I always think of Lucian Freud. And when I see a Freud portrait, um, most of what I see is Lucian Freud. I tend not to see the, the sitter that much. There are exceptions, but mostly what I see is a painter grappling with art history and his place in art history and the meaning of paint and the history of paint. And um, so there's a great book called The Man with a Blue Scarf that's about him painting John Deer, I can't remember his name, but an art critic who went and sat for Freud. And you could kind of see how abstractly Freud was approaching things in terms of paint application and light and color relationships. And I mean, I don't have anything like Freud's chops. I never will. And I do love his work, but I find it at times not as satisfying in terms of human presence as, um, I don't know, I would, one of my favorite people is, um, artist is uh, Vincent Desiderio. And for me, he also is grappling with art history, but he, his people are fully present. Um, and so that's one question is what's the intent of the artist? But my intent is because I'm coming out of a tradition where there are people missing from art history. That's my grappling. My grappling with art history is who's not in it, not, mm make an image, but who's not in it? And for me, you know, disabled people, certain kinds of queer people, trans people, non-binary, um, people who experience a lot of reasons for feeling um, unacceptable, 
uh, I could give a four hour lecture on why they're not there, but they're generally not there. And that's my grapple is to figure out how to bring them in, how not to freak them. Um, Cause I mean, images of people who are disabled, et cetera, exist, but they've often been as um, horrifically demeaning as the language, um, you know, medical mm. photographs and freak show posters and monster movies and this kind of thing, uh, Halloween costumes. Mm. And so I'm trying to find the story in the person that's going to let the viewer go, that's not going to let the viewer collapse who I'm depicting into the story that they're familiar with. So um, for me, yeah, the portrait is a story, but, but it's also a problem if that's true, because you can let go totally of formal consideration if you're only thinking about story. You can start forgetting about the needs of paint and the needs of composition and contemporary thoughts about where painting is. And um, I always think about, you remember that moment that Dylan said, well, I've done the words, now I want to do the music. He, there was... Um, I don't know the moment, but, uh, but, 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 but what a Dylan-esque and thought-provoking thing to say. It's, I think it was around when he did Desire. I remember reading an interview. Okay. Like, yeah. Desire. I've done the words, I want to do the music. Yeah, no, no, That's a great album. album. That's a beautiful album. That's, it's one of the best yeah but but the words are amazing as well damn him so he's kind of doing both <laughs> um it's it's peculiar and pleasing that you mentioned lucian freud uh about an hour ago i read a review of a new biography about him and i encountered this quote of freud's the whole mystery of art is why good things are good do you agree? And if so, is that the whole mystery of art? And if so, or even if you only partly agree, why are good things good? Oh, golly. Um, I mean, I can... That's not really a rabbit hole. It's kind of a rabbit um, An entire... subterranean bunker, isn't it? It's vast. It's, 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 it's like an underground cave network. <laughs> <laughs> Um, oh God, uh, I mean, good is such a bugaboo word in art criticism. Um, I, I, I think that there's not much that is universally good. Um, I think that, you know, not just taste, but whatever enculturation you come from is going to decide whether mm. you think something is good. Um, part of the struggle mm. is to let go of your culture and try and see what's really in front of you. And, you know, his good covers the waterfront. Um, I think more it's a mystery of why we need it. Like, why there's such a huge amount of human existence given over to everything that's art, everything, writing and dance. And I mean, we just absolutely need it. And, um, and that, you know, you think about animals, animals don't seem to have the same investment. And, you know, sometimes I read, uh, Articles about archaeology where they'll find, you know, early carved something or the first figurative something. And I just, oh my God, you know, time travel, just to go back and and see when somebody started making symbols. You know, just symbols for them, their own purpose and symbols for themselves, objects for itself. Yeah. Not like, yeah. Yeah. You know, writing on the rock, you know, buffalo this way bison ahead yeah. but but that that okay so when you make a work of art you know that you exist 
in a way that nothing else will ever prove to you. Uh, you posed an extraordinary question, uh, and I think you just gave an answer. Is that correct? Um, Maybe. The, the question, why do we need art? And the answer, because when you do it, you know you exist. Is that a correct summary of where we just went? Because it's a pretty cool place to have just gone. I, I, that's my answer, I guess, is, I mean, how do you feel? Like, you know, you're a, you're a parent, you have a complicated career, you go between countries, you do different kinds of, of writing and screenwriting and, and um, but when you make a work of art versus when you accomplish something else in your life, is there a way that you exist to yourself that's different? Um, I wish I were either a great big thinker who had thought about these things before and had fantastic, snappy, uh, beautifully polished answers to give you now, or I wish I was a great big thinker in the present tense and could easily improvise a fantastic answer now. I can do neither, but, 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 but I will try anyway, because, it, uh, because you did, and it seems very fair. I sometimes wonder if, if, if art is a kind of an accident, if art is, is an inadvertent side effect of this thing we call the imagination, I can see why the imagination evolved into being. I see why this gives us an evolutionary advantage. You can try stuff out without actually doing it. You can do thought experiments uh, without having to pay the physical price of those experiments going wrong. Now that's useful. Uh, it's also what that first part of Stanley Kubrick's 2001 is about, I think. Uh, the, God's slab appears and the monkey has an idea, hey, I can use this weapon as a bow, I can use this bone as a weapon. Let's have a go with this. Um, now, once the imagination evolves into being, not just human beings, I think, um, uh, when, when you were talking about early art, it reminded me of, uh, of an exhibition I went to in Texas a few years ago about Neanderthal art. It's not only Homo sapiens do this, but 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 uh, there was an exhibition case of stones that had been chipped by Neanderthals to look like birds or to have pleasing designs in them. Um, when animals display problem-solving intelligence, I think surely um, the imagination is at work. Near where I live in Ireland, there's a causeway by the sea and crows hang out there. Um, and yeah, um, they take mussels from the rocks, drop them on the roads and allow the tires of cars to drive over them so they can then get the fleshy bits inside. Uh, at some point, a crow must have worked out in its little corvine brain, which is not a word you get to use very often, but in its corvine brain. Uh, let's try this. Uh, and lo and behold, it works. And this can only be about 80, 90 years old because we've only had cars in Ireland for that length of time. Um, so it's not any human beings uh, have imaginations. But once imaginations come to exist, we it's an itch that constantly needs to be scratched. It's an appetite that constantly needs to be satiated. And we satiate it by art. We satiate it by narrative from, from cave paintings to Netflix. It's the same continuum and the same hunger is being satiated by the same means. Uh, so that is my response to the uh, bombshell of a question you just lit. Uh, you're asking what is art for? <laughs> it doesn't get any more profound than this. <laughs> well, speaking of art, well, first off, um, I know we're running out of time. I didn't know if you wanted to look at any. Oh, five minutes left, that's impossible. 
I only thought we'd been going for 20 minutes. Oh, okay. <laughs> the best movie I've ever seen about the purpose of art is Pan's Labyrinth. So anyway, for... Yeah, yeah. That's, it's Pan's Labyrinth. But did you want to look at anything before they uh, shuffle us off to Buffalo? <laughs> <laughs> um, you see, you're using language again. It's making me smile. Your book's full of this. It, it's 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 so you. Your voice is in every sentence, and every sentence is really interesting. I've written a, f- a few things in the act of vocabulary, congruences, bugaboo. I've never used either of those words in my life, but I love hearing them. You have a massive vocabulary, and it's there in your book. Um, yeah, um, and it will bring us back a little bit to the idea of a portrait being a story and your portraits in particular being, uh, you do remember the purpose of paint. You never forget the technical aspects, but you also paint stories and my imagination, as well as just my, my, my eyeball enjoys them, but my imagination cannot but try to, decode and speculate what I'm seeing. Um, I feel this about all your work. Uh, however, uh, I'd love you to share a little bit uh, about a painting um, called, I believe, Tim slash Owl, because it is poignant and beautiful and makes me think things I'm not, I can't quite identify a name, which I love in art. Um, so I think it's going to be I think it will Im- magically appear on people's screens now. Uh, I know it really well because I looked at it for about 15 minutes earlier, just exploring it and wondering about it. So please um, please elaborate a little, if you would, Riva. Pieces in the world, and I think that you would really particularly love it um, because it's the story of a father with a disabled child. And it's my friend, Tim Lowley, who is an astonishing painter, one of the great painters in the country. And his daughter, Tema, um, when she was a newborn, had a, um, a kind of stroke, I believe, and now is very, very profoundly disabled, um, does not have bodily control or verbal control. And I had wanted to do Tim's portrait. Um, he wanted me to do her portrait. But because my work is all about informed consent and Tema cannot consent, I felt that I could not, um, I couldn't depict her. It, it, that's really core to my ethics is somebody choosing mm. to do this. So I thought, you know, again, going back to the book of like, okay, what do you do with a story when you can't tell the story? So I did a portrait of their relationship and Tim is, is uh, deeply Christian in the way that I find just immensely moving and admirable. And so I was thinking mm. of um, a Pieta partly, but also it's part of this series uh, where people are in animal costumes as a way of seeing themselves from the outside, um, not just connecting mm. to animals as mirrors that we are slowly destroying. It's called mirror shards. And so Hmm. I wanted this wisdom to be something that Tim was pulling on, trying to see through, that he was literally taking on his daughter's body. Um, And because Tim is such a profound person, and I can tell a lot of it is because of the kind of questioning of the nature of love that he and his wife, Sherry, who's a reverend, have gone through loving a person who cannot clearly, in ways that we understand, love you back in any way. And Mm. so they've really thought a lot about the idea that humans are supposed to earn love, deserve love. Their conviction is that if you exist, you deserve love, full stop. And that is how they live their lives. And so... I see Tim and Tema as inseparable. Um, and, you know, a complicated relationship, but one of, he's one of those, I call him my brother 
you know, my painting brother. He, he's about to do my portrait after all these years. I, I don't let people do that. I'm gonna go sit for Tim because I believe so deeply in hey. So I think, you know, as the father of a disabled child, you probably thought a lot about love yourself. Yes, and what you say uh, feels very true. Um, neurotypical people, and in your context, perhaps um, corporeally able people, we we see we see the world so much on our own, on, on on our own terms, so much more than we think we do. We we will only call something intelligent if it's intelligent upon a scale that we have devised. We are generally pretty rubbish at understanding. Uh, that intelligence is a plural and the only thing an IQ test tells you anything about is your ability to do well or not well at IQ tests. It's not a measure of intelligence, it's only a measure of our, um, a very reductive model of intelligence and um, these thoughts are thoughts I would not have had uh, if my son hadn't taught them to me, if, 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 if I hadn't had to shape the way to reboot the way I think. Um, I'm sorry that he has to pay the cost of my um, self-improvement, but that doesn't make me, that doesn't lessen my gratitude that, um, that he's brought brand new thoughts into my life that, that I think make me, a fuller human being, less hidebound by, by, by the unconscious dictates of the neurotypical tribe. Well, I think every good relationship, relationship should do that, make us new. Amen and alleluia. Um, and isn't it cool that the owl is uh, the familiar of Athena, the goddess of wisdom. Exactly. And it says who? And we don't, we can only guess who Tema is because she is not verbal. And I thought a lot about that. Like it's the embodiment of who? I think that we are done. Oh. <laughs> oh, Reva, this has been such a pleasure. Uh, let's do this again soon. I would love that. <laughs> Okay, look, I'm giving you a big hug via Zoom. It's it, 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 it's about a 6,000 mile socially distanced hug. It's not six feet, it's 6,000 miles, but there you go in a way. I would, uh, I really should respond with something. Uh, I've only got an Apple call, which I know what I'll show you. Just stay here a moment. any good movies lately everybody go see Bands labyrinth go see sense eight go see cloud atlas you might not be able to see this so well but this is this is a piece of tiger's eye and on one side it is it is gold tiger's eye and on the other side it is blue tiger's eye and i love to have this around because uh, it suggests that um it it's it's a reminder that um, things that are different can also be one, and if we, this is true for a single human being. We've got all these aspects of ourselves, but it can be true for a society. And maybe, maybe, an achievable utopia is a place where things that are different, um, bodily, neurologically, uh, can also be equal parts of a greater whole and it will be greater when when things that are different are also one you can't really see it but that's my tiger's eye um loads of love Reva. i think we're out of time um let's hook up again soon and you take care of yourself in this crazy world in this crazy time last thing i'll say everybody go to my website my portrait of david is on it 
and all of the writing on it is David. He documented his last six days in Chicago on his own portrait, and I treasure it to the tiniest of bits. Good night, everyone. Ah, uh, bless you. Good night. Bye bye. <laughs> bye.